Now that we've looked at how uh, microbes grow and uh, how to measure their growth, um, let's talk about the care and feeding aspect. Factors that affect microbial growth. Some of these are going to be nutritional factors. Some of these are going to be environmental factors, but these are all gonna deal with like things that affect how microbes grow, mostly in the environment, uh, as opposed to in the lab. Uh, in the lab, you can control all of these things, and unless you're doing some sort of weird experiment, um, usually you keep them at whatever the microbial optimum is. So the first thing to keep in mind, and this is universal for all microbes, is that, in fact, this is universal for all living things. Um, all living things need a source of energy and a source of carbon. All life is carbon-based, uh, other than water, uh, all of the organic portions of our bodies, of whatever you are, are made out of organic molecules, and organic molecules are based around carbon. Um, so if you are going to get bigger, to either to grow in any fashion, to either get bigger or to divide or to increase in any way, or even in the long term just to maintain yourself, you're going to need some source of specifically organic carbon that you can incorporate into your structure. In addition, all living things require energy. It's like right on the list of things that are like qualities of life is that you use energy um, to maintain homeostasis largely. Uh, homeostasis does not maintain itself. The universe tends naturally towards chaos Maintaining an internal order requires the expenditure of energy. So you're going to have to get that energy from somewhere, and you're going to have to get that organic carbon from somewhere. And uh, there's basically two sources of each in general. So uh, energy can either come from light or from some sort of chemical compound. If you get energy from light, you are a phototroph. The troph meaning to eat, and photo meaning light. If you get your energy from chemicals of whatever sort, then you are a chemotroph. Um, chemotropes can be further divided into uh, chemoorganotrophs, which get their energy from breaking down organic chemicals, usually into some sort of inorganic base substrate like carbon dioxide and water. If you get your uh, energy from inorganic uh, chemicals, that you are often called a chemolithotroph. Um, these get their energy from like high energy, um, you, like salt or mineral compounds. Litho means rock. And so like they're often going to be getting it from, you know, sulfur, um, you know, sulfuric acid, hydrogen sulfide, uh, some nitrate compounds, sometimes from iron. Um, things like that, right? So those are the places where you can get your energy. Now, as far as organic carbon goes, there's really two ways. You're either going to get it from someone else or you're going to make it yourself, all right? If you get it from someone else, then that means you eat something that has organic carbon, and then you take that organic carbon and you incorporate it into yourself, and you can often change it. Um, but you're probably, you know, you, you're keeping it organic at that point and turning it into your structure. Uh, and when I say eat, like that also includes, you know, just absorbing organic compounds that happen to be in the uh, natural world and things like that. Uh, the other option is you can make your own organic carbon. Now, you can't make the carbon itself. You can't make 
Adams unless you are a star, which you're not. Um, and uh, But you can take inorganic carbon, which is available abundantly, and you can convert it into organic carbon. The most common source of organic carbon, or of inorganic carbon, is carbon dioxide. Uh, and so this process takes energy, right? So it, it will require energy to take carbon dioxide and turn it into organic carbon. Uh, but it can be done. If you get uh, your organic carbon by finding organic carbon somewhere out there in the world, probably in another organism or something like that, and then taking that into yourself, then you are a heterotroph. Uh, hetero means other or different. Um, so you're getting your organic carbon from something else that already has it. If you are making your own organic carbon by taking inorganic carbon dioxide and basically smashing them together at high energies until they hook up, uh, then you are an autotroph. Auto meaning self. You make your organic carbon yourself. These attributes can be combined. If you get your energy from light and you make your own organic carbon from carbon dioxide, you are a photo autotroph. Uh, most plants fall into this category, as do many algae and some photosynthetic bacteria. Um, autotrophs are what are called primary producers. Uh, since some things take organic carbon and then reduce it to inorganic carbon, we would run out of organic carbon unless we had something that was capable of making more. Those things which can take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and fix it into organic uh, molecules form the base of the food chain. And uh, they're, they're what are called primary producers, and you cannot have an ecosystem without primary producers. The organic carbon has to come from somewhere, and it doesn't really just happen on its own very often. Not saying it can't happen on its own, but it doesn't happen at large numbers. So throughout most of planet Earth, photoautotrophs are the primary producers in most ecosystems. Right? On land, it's usually going to be plants. Uh, in, the, uh, in the water, it's usually going to be algae or bacteria. If you get your energy from chemicals, but make your own organic molecules from carbon dioxide, you are a chemo-autotroph. Usually, this means that you are a chemolitho-autotroph, right? Uh, because, you know, if you, it, it would be sort of silly if you got your energy from organic carbon and then used that energy to make organic carbon. Um, it's like, if you have organic carbon, why not just incorporate that into yourself? Why go through the energy-intensive, troubling process of building organic carbon? So these are usually going to be things that get their energy from non-organic chemicals, so from uh, litho, uh, lithotrophs, um, and they get their organic molecules, because they don't have any organic molecules around, they got to make it on their own from carbon dioxide. So these are chemo-autotrophs or chemolithoautotrophs. These are not super common, but they form the primary producers in ecosystems that do not have access to the sun. Um, particularly, this is true in deep ocean ecosystems, so like far, far below the ocean depths where no sunlight gets to, uh, there are these uh, cracks in the Earth's crust uh, that 
um, let basically high, very, very hot, high energy molecules from the Earth's mantle, from the lava, uh, leak into the surface. And so you have this like super high, super mineral, or super hot, super mineral rich water comes squirting out of these things. They're called black smoker vents because they have so many minerals in them that when they come in contact with the normal seawater, those minerals kind of precipitate out and it looks sort of like black smoke or it would if anything down there had eyes. And usually at the bottom of the ocean, there's like almost nothing a lot, right? Anything that lives at the bottom of the ocean, there's like a few crabs and stuff like that. Mostly they live on like dead fish and whales that die and then manage to make it all the way down to the bottom. Um, and, but you, you'll find these black smoker vents with hugely diverse communities of life around them. And anywhere you find that much life, you gotta ask yourself, where's the carbon coming from? Right? These aren't places where like a bunch of whales fall, so it's not coming from the surface. Where's the carbon coming from? Um, well, you have these uh, bacteria, chemolithoautotrophs, that eat the high energy compounds coming out of the black smoker vents. They extract a whole bunch of energy from them, and then they use that energy, which is very abundant, uh, to take carbon dioxide that's dissolved in the water and make organic molecules from that. And then other things eat those bacteria and then other other things eat those other things and so on, creating an entire ecosystem. Uh, but it's not a super efficient method of, uh, of getting energy. It's pretty restricted to only these areas where you have these black smoker vents. So you don't find this used very often on the surface of the Earth. Uh, if sunlight is available, usually photoautotrophs will outcompete chemoautotrophs. But in these places where light cannot get to, um, this is how life exists. If you get your energy from light and you get your organic molecules by eating things or by absorbing organic carbon from your environment, you are a photoheterotroph. Again, this is relatively rare, but does happen. These are things that are photosynthetic. They get their energy from the sun. Um, but either they practice a type of photosynthesis that isn't good for fixing carbon, uh, and um, purple non-sulfur bacteria do that, uh, or they simply uh, don't get enough energy from the sun that they can afford to waste some of it uh, by making organic compounds. Um, and so they'll be modal and photosynthetic, but also go around occasionally hunting things down so that they can get their carbon molecules. That'd be a uh, green non-sulfur bacteria. Uh, and so these are going to be things that like they get their energy from the sun. So they can survive with just sunlight. But if they're going to grow and reproduce, they have to be able to accumulate more mass, which means they more, need more stuff. They need more organic molecules. Those organic molecules have to come from somewhere. They can't make them their own because they're a heterotroph. And so they do have to do some hunting or some scavenging, specifically looking for organic molecules that they're going to incorporate into themselves. Pretty rare, but does happen. Over here, if you get your energy from chemicals and you get your organic carbon from like organic carbon that you go out and find and then incorporate into yourself, probably through eating, you are a chemoheterotroph. I am a chemoheterotroph. I'm pretty sure you are as well. So are all animals, pretty much all fungi, um, lots of protozoa, but not all of them. Some of them are over here. 
uh, and um, a lot of bacteria, like say E. coli, is a chemoheterotroph. It means that you're getting your energy probably from organic carbon, and you're getting your organic carbon from organic carbon. So you're eating like glucose or sugar or something like that, and you're taking some of it and turning it into uh, energy, and you're taking some of it and incorporating it into your body. So all living things require energy and organic carbon. Base level, right? Uh, all living things also require certain elements. Some of them it requires in great numbers. Uh, and that is what, what I call the, the big four, right? Carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen. That's like more than 90% of your body right there. Um, so you got to get those elements in large numbers, and you probably get them from whatever your organic carbon source is, and from water. You also need uh, medium high levels of sulfur, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, calcium, and iron. Like, you don't actually need that much of any of those, but you need enough that you have to care about whether you're getting enough of them. And this is true whether you're a human or a bacteria. So um, if there are bacteria that can subsist perfectly fine uh, on glucose, which contains carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, access to the atmosphere, which is about 80% nitrogen, and a few salts. Usually it's going to be some sort of uh, sulfate, a phosphate, potassium chloride, magnesium chloride, calcium chloride, um, sodium in here, mm, sodium uh, as well. And give them those salts and a carbon source and they can survive. We can't do that, but there are lots of bacteria that can. Uh, you also need what are called trace elements. These are things that you have to have, but you need in only such minuscule levels that you usually just don't need to worry about them. If you live in the world, unless you live in a weird place in the world, then there will just be enough of these things around that you don't have to worry about adding. And that's Cobalt, copper, zinc, molybdenum, and manganese. Uh, anything that you require in excess of those things, so anything that you cannot make on your own, is what is considered a growth factor requirement. Uh, growth factors are most typically like chemicals of some sort, like uh, you know, hemoglobin or heme. Um, you know, it might be uh, certain other compounds. Um, could be uh, certain amino acids that you just can't make on your own, but you have to have tryptophan, something like that. Um, growth factor requirements can also be environmental. Um, you could consider like oxygen a growth factor requirement for aerobic organisms. It's usually not considered, but it technically fits the definition. Um, so these are growth factor requirements. And uh, bacteria that require a lot of growth factor requirements are called fastidious. Now, fastidious means picky. Um, so they're picky eaters, right? Some bacteria, E. coli, can just survive on minimal media. Uh, some bacteria requires a normal complex media, which basically just contains, you know, some nitrogen compounds, some, uh, you know, some amino acids, stuff like that, as well as sugar and salts. But some bacteria are particularly picky. They have lots of particular growth factor er, requirements and like they don't grow on normal media 
and they have to have a lot of things added to them. And those are bacteria that we usually call fastidious. Generally speaking, fastidious bacteria need to be grown on enriched, on special enriched media. And um, different sorts of enriched media are going to be good at growing different types of fastidious bacteria. Not everyone is picky in the same way. Environmental conditions. Uh, temperature. So uh, different bacteria like to live at different temperatures and there are uh, generally five categories that I want you to know. Uh, bear in mind that like individual bacteria are going to be optimized at different places within these categories. But this is how we talk about things. So, psychrophiles. Psychro meaning cold, file meaning to low. Uh, these live at an optimal temperature from minus 5 to 15 degrees Celsius. That's like below freezing to a bit above freezing. Um, these bacteria are often found in Arctic and Antarctic regions. Uh, in tundra, tops of mountains, um, things like that. Uh, actually, they're often, um, some of them are going to be archaea, some of them are going to be molds or other fungi. Uh, but uh, yeah, so they live very low temperatures. Almost none of these are going to be pathogens because... Well, if you are at 15, like if your body temp is 15 degrees Celsius, it is because you are dead. And so, like, they're just not going to find you to be a very hospitable place to live while you're alive. Next, and uh, is not quite actually on this... Uh, on here, it would be like... that are psychrotrophs. Psychro, again meaning cold, troph meaning uh, to eat or to grow. And um, these live at around 20 to 30 degrees Celsius to give you uh, some orientation because we apparently decided to never teach metric in this com country. Uh, 25 degrees Celsius is considered room temperature. So these are things that live at around room temperature, um, which is basically a normal temperature for it to be outside in a temperate region. Not like here in Las Vegas necessarily, at least not this summer, but like most places, you know, you live in you know, Oregon or something like that. This is a normal temperature for it to be. So a lot of psychotrophs are environmental bacteria. They just live outside in the world because that's they live at normal world temperatures. Um, soil bacteria often fall into this category. Um, bacteria that live in lakes, rivers, streams, oceans also often fall into this category. Um, some things in this category are pathogenic. Um, but usually they either live at kind of the very top range here and can sort of transition into the next category, or there's a whole set of soil bacteria that actually, um, cause disease, uh, not because they are particularly good at growing in you, but because they make toxins. So like, even if they can't grow in you very well, what they could do is grow on the surface of your skin, which is basically much closer to room temperature, and they can make toxins that then penetrate your body and do nasty things to you. So this is things like uh, anthrax, uh, botulism, tetanus. Uh, these are bacteria that normally live in the soil. They're basically psychotrophs. Um, they don't actually get into your blood and colonize your body very well, but they, um, uh, but they do make toxins that can get in and harm you. Uh, most food spoilage organisms uh, fall into this category as well, 
Because if you think, where is your food going to be where it spoils, it's like food that you've left out will spoil or get moldy or whatever. And uh, yeah, I, I know that usually you put food in the refrigerator nowadays, realize that that's a, a, a recent thing. Fridges are like 100 years old, that's it. Next category up is mesophiles. Uh, meso meaning middle, uh, because we humans came up with this scale. And the mesophiles are those that live at around human body temperature. And naturally, we assume that our body temperature must be the middle temperature for the entire universe. So we put middle temperature. Those that love to live in middle temperatures are the ones that live in us. Uh, obviously, we're not the average temperature of the universe. But, uh, but this is what we call them. They live from 25 to 45 degrees Celsius. To give you some orientation, human body temperature is 37, so pretty much smack dab in the middle there, or pretty close to it. Uh, and um, 25, again, is room temperature. 45, you can think of as being a nice, hot bath. Like, not scalding, but the sort of bath that you put your toe in, you go, mm, that's a nice hot bath. That's 45. Um, most pathogens are mesophiles because if you're going to live in a human, it helps if you like to live at human body temperature. Uh, and I don't want to say that, that most bacteria live here, but most of the bacteria that we're going to study in this class are mesophiles. Right. Next up, thermophiles, 45 degrees Celsius to 70 degrees Celsius. Uh, if 45 degrees is that's a nice hot bath, uh, 70 degrees Celsius is will scald you. I mean, it's not like boiling, but it's hot enough that it's going to do some damage. It's going to hurt. These sorts of bacteria are most commonly found in like hot springs, right? Um, not necessarily like, you know, geysers but we're talking relatively hot water um, in, you know, places like Japan, Iceland, Pacific Northwest, that kind of thing. Highest category here is hyperthermophiles. Uh, so thermo meaning heat, file meaning to love. Thermophiles love it hot. Hyperthermophiles love it really hot. They're usually archaea. They're extremophiles. Um, they live in water that is 70 to 110 degrees Celsius. Now remember that 100 degrees Celsius is boiling. So uh, these things are living in water that's hotter than boiling. How do you get water that's hotter than boiling? It has to be under a lot of pressure. So these are going to be found around those hydrothermal vents, the black smoker vents that I was just talking about. So they're often going to be uh, chemolithoautotrophs, um, typically archaea, and, um, and they can be around these really super hot places. Uh, at the lower end here, around 70 to, say, 90, they might be in, like, geyser runoff water or sort of like the boiling hot springs up at Yellowstone, that kind of thing. But they're still, mm, that's really hot. Okay, oxygen. Some things like it, other things don't. Uh, obligate aerobic. So for this picture, the way I want you to interpret it is, uh, so in this tube, right, it's not being shaken around or anything. So stuff near the top, the, the liquid near the top has lots of oxygen dissolved in it because oxygen from the atmosphere can get in there. The farther down the tube you go, the less and less and less oxygen there is because oxygen doesn't get too far down. And this is actually the way things work in the ocean as well. Um, water near the surface of the ocean uh, or a lake or whatever 
is usually relatively rich in oxygen, whereas if you go way far down, the water is much more poor in oxygen. Obligate aerobes. An obligation is something that you have to do. You don't have a choice about it. You got to do it. So obligate aerobes have to use oxygen. Aerobic means oxygen using. When you're doing aerobic exercise, you got to breathe. <sighs> right? So it's oxygen using exercise. That's what aerobic means, oxygen using. Um, there are two enzymes that you need to, uh, uh, to have if you're going to use oxygen. Um, one of them is called catalase. The other is called superoxide dismutase. And uh, catalase is necessary if you're going to use oxygen. When you use oxygen metabolically, you make, uh, just as an accidental byproduct, uh, you make these, uh, these things called peroxides, particularly hydrogen peroxide, and peroxides are really, really nasty, toxic compounds. They will kill stuff. They disintegrate into what are called free radicals that then go around tearing everything up. Not awesome. Um, and catalase is the enzyme that takes hydrogen peroxide and turns it into oxygen and water, both of which are relatively neutral. Uh, superoxides are a uh, type of react reactive oxygen ion, which can be uh, a byproduct of oxygen metabolism. You certainly make more of them if you're using oxygen. Um, but uh, they can also occur naturally anytime you are in the presence of high amounts of oxygen. Um, oxygen, by the way, is a poison. Uh, the first life on Earth did not use oxygen uh, because there was no oxygen in the atmosphere. Uh, then came the development of the first photosynthetic organisms. Those first photosynthetic organisms started churning out a whole bunch of oxygen. Um, and that oxygen was a poison to pretty much all life on the planet. And so there was very early on uh, in, in Earth's history, there was a huge catastrophic die-off event as most things died because al oxygen killed them. Um, like, oxygen is really, really nasty. Uh, it, it's, it's one of those drugs that's really hard to quit, though. Um, like, I, it is a major contributor to the process that we call aging. They've done some studies, and, um, like... A lot of the damage that we consider the aging process to be is actually damage from oxygen. So if you could hold your breath long enough, you could live forever. Uh, good luck trying, though. Uh, but uh, eventually, life survived, obviously, because we're here. And that's because a lot of it learned how to live in the presence of oxygen. It developed these special protective enzymes like superoxide dismutase. And then other organisms discovered, hey, actually this oxygen can be used to do some really cool stuff metabolically. I can use it to make a lot of energy. And if you're using it, then you need catalase. So these obligate aerobes use oxygen. They have to have oxygen. They die without it. And they're going to have both catalase and superoxide dismutase. Next, obligate anaerobes. An means without. So these are things that have to not have oxygen. Where are they going to live? They're going to live as far away from the oxygen as they can get. Because if oxygen is around, it will kill them. They have no protections against oxygen and they don't use it. Um, so they're only going to grow where there's no oxygen. They have no catalase. They have no superoxide dismutase. Next, facultative anaerobes. Uh, by the way, it says facultative anaerobes because they can live anaerobically. Technically, these organisms are aerobic because they can also live aerobically. Facultative, 
right? If you have the facility to do something, you can do it. You don't have to do it. These are things that prefer to live with oxygen. If oxygen is around, they will use oxygen. They will grow better, faster, quicker, stronger. Um, but if there is no oxygen around, they don't just die like we do. They can switch to an alternate form of metabolism that uh, is usually a type of fermentation. And even though they won't be making as much energy, they still make enough for them to survive. So where are you gonna see these things growing? Well, there's gonna be a lot of them up close to where there's oxygen, but you're gonna still find some growing all the way down because they don't have to have oxygen to live. They just grow better with it. Um, because these are capable of using oxygen and living in oxygen, they need both catalase and superoxide dismutase. Um, although they might not make those if there aren't any, isn't any oxygen around, they have to have the ability to make them. All right, next, aerotolerant anaerobes. Uh, these are anaerobes. They do not use oxygen, but they're tolerant to it. Like, you know, they're cool with it. They don't use themselves. When you, you come over and you go, oh, hey, man, you mind if I bring some oxygen here? And they're like, oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's fine. I'm not an oxygen user myself, but I don't have any problems. If you want to imbibe in some oxygen, feel, please feel free. Um, so they're very, very tolerant. They're very cool. They're chill. Uh, and they don't use oxygen, but it doesn't kill them. So where are they going to grow? They're going to grow wherever the hell they want to grow. And they're gonna grow about the same wherever the hell they wanna grow. They're gonna grow about the same up here, about the same down there. They don't care about the oxygen. Um, they usually do not have catalase because they don't use oxygen. So they don't make peroxides. But they still have to deal with the naturally occurring superoxides uh, that happen any place where you have oxygen. So they are going to, uh, to have superoxide dismutase to protect them from that. Last, we have microaerophiles. Micro means small, aero means air, file means to love. They love a little bit of air. I call these the Goldilocks bacteria. They kind of have the worst of both worlds. They are aerobic. They have to have oxygen to survive. But it also kills them. That sucks, right? So they're like, you know, oh, this porridge is too hot. No, this porridge is too cold. Ah, this is just right. So they can't live up here where there's lots of oxygen because the oxygen will kill them at high concentrations. They can't live down here where there isn't any oxygen because they have to have oxygen to survive. Where are they going to live? Uh, they're going to live kind of here in the Goldilocks zone. Uh, because they need a little bit of oxygen, but not too much. Um, usually they need anywhere from 1 to 10% oxygen. Uh, and uh, oxygen in, in the atmosphere around us is at about 20%. So uh, these will only grow in places of reduced oxygen capacity. They will usually have no catalase and no superoxide dismutase, or they might have like a little bit of either or both, uh, but not enough to protect them in uh, the full oxygen environment. pH. Uh, most bacteria like a neutral pH, right? Not acidic, not basic. We call them neutrophiles. That's most bacteria. The vast majority of bacteria fall into that category. Um, some bacteria like to live in very acidic environments. They thrive at below pH 5.5, and we call them acidophiles. Um, these are uh, often going to be food spoilage organisms. 
um, like the the things that eat that turn milk sour um, or that turn milk into cheese or make vinegar or anything like that. What they're doing is they're making acid because they like to live in an acidic environment. Uh, bacteria that like to live at um, higher pHs, at basic pHs, are called alkalophiles. Uh, we don't call them basophiles because, I don't know, basic sounds kind of weird. Basic has a whole bunch of different meanings. Um, like they're, they're like bacteria that love to be basic aren't bacteria that really love pumpkin spice lattes and Ugg boots. They're, um, you know, they, they just like high pH. All right, so we call them alkalophiles to avoid confusion. Water availability. Um, all living things require water to survive, right? Um, now, bacteria just don't grow very well if it's just like dry out. Uh, but there's another way that you can reduce water availability and that is through salting, right? And so we preserve a lot of foods by adding a bunch of salt and pickling them or sugar and preserving them. In both cases, what this does is it exerts osmotic pressure. Um, and you guys should be sort of familiar with osmosis from intro bio. If not, go look it up because you want to know about osmosis. Uh, and if um, uh, the, these, these, uh, if you are in an, a high salt environment, um, water will actually get pulled out of you. Like you may have heard that if you're on a desert island in the middle of the ocean, you should never drink the seawater, right? Because you will actually dehydrate faster. You will die of thirst faster if you drink seawater because the salt will actually pull water out of your body, right? So if you have very high, very highly salty water, uh, it's going to pull uh, water out of bacteria. And that will usually kill the bacteria. Uh, some bacteria, however, can survive in halt, uh, high salt environments. Um, Osmotolerant, or also sometimes called halo-tolerant bacteria, uh, tolerate high salt environments. Again, they're tolerant. They don't require it. They're like, ah, I don't need high salt, but it doesn't bother me. And um, so they can live in high salt environments, usually moderately high salt environments, but they can also live in environments without all that much salt in it. Um, then you have halo files. Halo meaning salt. These are salt lovers. Uh, and they require a high salt environment, usually a very high salt environment. Uh, they live in high salt, and if they are not in high salt, they will die. <laughs> Kaput. Uh, we also have, um, yeah, so water availability, um, pressure, bacteria that grow in very, very high depths or low depths, I guess, deep, deep beneath the ocean, are adapted to live at very high water pressures. And they are called barophiles. And they require those high pressures in order to survive. If you try to culture them up here at the surface, uh, then they won't live very well. Uh, some bacteria require high levels of CO2. Uh, CO2 in our atmosphere is at, like, 0.1%, which is plenty. Uh, but there are some bacteria that require high carbon dioxide environments to live. Those bacteria are called capnophiles. And those are basically the terms for uh, and, and environments that I want you guys to know uh, for what affects microbial growth.